I'm Jeff Gibbon with American Purpose. I'll be joined today with American Purpose uh, by American Purpose Managing Editor Carolyn Stewart to moderate the first part of this conversation with our two distinguished guests of honor. We'll run one hour, hard stop, 1 p.m. Eastern. And what a pleasure and a privilege to have with us today, Dorothy Kozinski, who is a dear friend, who is the director emerita, if I said that right, of the Phillips Collection, this jewel among museums in Washington, nation and worldwide, who is a historian, an author, and just a, a brilliant conversation partner. And Dan Weiss, joining us from New York, who, as you know, is the CEO, the chief executive of Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dan also has a relatively new book out. If I have it right, it's end of the last calendar year. Remember, Yale University Press, Why Museum Matters. And before we dive in, Sid Lipset, thank you. You are the arts and culture editor of American Purpose. You do a thousand things really beautifully, elegantly, but this program was your idea and you drove it and you're curating it. It's thanks to you that we're here today. So with that, I'm going to dive in. I'm going to ask first question to Dorothy Kuczynski and then the same question to you, Dan, and it's not stuck in high-minded principle or theory or even practice of what we're talking about today. If the subject matter today is why the museum matters. If I may, Dorothy, what was your first experience with the museum that caught fire with you? Was it as a school child? Was it your parents? Was it a teacher? Was it a, uh, an excursion or field trip? Uh, of course, your life has taken many turns and paths involving art and the museum, but how Earliest in your life and career, how did you get started in this? Hmm. Well, I, I am not one of those individuals who professes to have a um, revelatory experience. Um, you know, at, at age seven, that simply was not part of my background and upbringing. Um, I would say that um, the most impactful and earliest experience was while an undergraduate at Yale, where I had the privilege to have my uh, education in art history unfold largely in the art gallery and in the conservation studio. And for me, that was an, it had an enduring impact because um, the idea that the object is uh, central to the mission, to the learning experience, and that understanding um, art um, truly through the object, and I should say also through the voice of the artist, the, the artistic practice, became fundamental and carried me through graduate school and my first, you know, sort of baby museum experience, which was at the Guggenheim in New York in the mid seventies, uh, early eighties. But I, I, I emphasized that the um, the experience in the class, dark classroom with many slides, I think had a uh, much less impact, meaning and, uh, formative, uh, change in how I saw the art around me than that more hands-on, um, close and personal experience with, with the object itself. So, Dorothy, thank you for that. And and you said the word experience, which I think is so, so important in these things. Dan, can we ask the same question to you as as one says, what turned you on early in life to the museum and the experience? Well, I think I had early in my life, I had two revelatory experiences. One was in a museum, which happens to be the Metropolitan, and the other was becoming an art historian in college in a classroom. But I, I first visited the Met as a junior in high school, where I was taking a course on the humanities. I, I grew up on Long Island. And our teacher brought us to New York to come to the Met to see art, which was part of the class. I had no particular sense of art. I wasn't particularly interested in it. 
but I found the whole experience to be dazzling and inspiring. The idea that actually we could go inside this magisterial building on Fifth Avenue, that we were allowed in, and that we could actually walk around and see what it had to offer was really eye-opening for me. And I found myself very taken by the whole experience. I've learned in retrospect from my own work at the Met that it makes a very big difference that your first experience in a museum is a positive one that's welcoming and that creates a sense of well-being and enthusiasm when you're there to sustain one's interest in coming back. I had that experience. And from that moment to this one, I've always thought of this place, as it were, as my place. And I never anticipated I'd actually work there. And here we are. Well, and there you are. How about that? Uh, the book that I mentioned that you've written and was published at the end of the last calendar year, Dan, it is a wonderful book, Why the Museum Matters. It, it is prose, which is clear as glass. It, it's such a friendly and inviting read. And you tackle very hard problems in a very clear and I would say succinct way. So it, it's really admirable. And to you all who have not yet read the book, uh, there are a number of interesting chapters on the museum's platform for ideas the civic function of the museum. And we're coming to that shortly. And I think that Dorothy has a lot to say and a lot of relevant experience in many of those areas, including the museum as a civic enterprise. But first things first, and then my last question before I turn it over to you, Carolyn. Dan, can, can you tell us a little bit, it's early in your book, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, the tra tradition of the museum in Europe and what was adopted in America and how America has adapted the idea of the museum and why not push ahead, how it's being adapted rapidly as we speak. Well, I was struck in my own ref ref study on this question by both the similarities and the very distinct differences between say the American version of the European model. And I think the American museum movement in large part was born out of a competitive impulse in the 19th century to create institutions that enlivened and enriched cities the way European museums had done in the age of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, primarily. And so I know, for example, for the Metropolitan Museum, a, a group of New York citizens, leaders in, in among the community, including uh, the, uh, well, a variety of them, John Jay, the grandson of the original Supreme Court, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was one of them. And they came to Paris and they had the idea that they wanted to create a cultural entity in Manhattan comparable to the Louvre. And what's so striking about that is the ambition wasn't a museum. It was to create a museum like the Louvre the, of that scale and grandeur, even though they actually had at the moment of that inspiration, no art, just ambition. And they then came back to New York and created this entity. So the impulse was in the first instance, I think, to create cities that have more to offer than just economic opportunity, but also cultural well-being. And the, the movement in the United States took off. The fundamental, so I think the continuity of the idea was to understand what museums can bring to a community in terms of providing enlightenment and access to education, inspiration for everyone, not just the elite community, but everyone. The difference in the American model that I think is very important, and it actually relates to the entire arc of the American history of museums, is that museums were created by, funded by, and run by the communities in the United States, for the most part, not by the government. And the Louvre, we are not the Louvre. We are run by a board of trustees elected by their own community, and we serve the community, and we're funded by the community. We get modest amounts of money from the government, as most American museums get modest amount of money from the government. It changes everything. It creates museums that look and feel more like private universities than public institutions in service to the government. And I think that has changed the way we program, how we think about our, our, uh, our mission. And as we look to the future, I think there's great value in being that accountable to the discrepant and divergent voices in the community to be responsive to them in ways and accountable to them in ways a government-funded entity isn't. So, so, Dan, thank you. I found it very interesting that, that uh, indeed, in passages in your book, you talk about responsibility and accountability. 
and uh, more about that, I think, in due course. But for now, may I turn this over to Carolyn and Carolyn and Dorothy for the next bit of this conversation. Carolyn? Great. Well, thank you so much. And this has been really lovely so far. So I was hoping to uh, ask both Dorothy and Dan a question, but starting with, so Dorothy, you recently, the Phillips Collection, led the Centennial Celebration. And as part of that, there was the exhibition Seen Differently, uh, the Philip Collects for a New Century. And I think what's really interesting about that is that you have this idea of how has the Phillips Collection's collection changed in the last hundred years? How has its you know acquisition strategy adapted to the time, different attitudes? And I thought that that exhibition really paired beautifully with, uh, you know, one of the ideas that Dan talks about in his book, which is the idea that museums are platforms for ideas. And uh, Dan has a, a great way of describing what I think the ideal museum is. And he says, you know, uh, an art museum can contain the finest creative ideas of countless civilizations across the entire arc of human history, uh, <laughs> which is a great, a great way of looking at it, right? Like slap that on a mug sell it in the gift shop. I'm here for it. I, I, I want that. Uh, so I'd like to ask, starting with Dorothy and then moving on to Dan, can you tell us a little bit about kind of in your time at the Phillips Collection, how did you embrace that idea that uh, museums are a platform for ideas? You know, what, what opportunities and what burdens does that entail? Well, and for those of you who don't know the Phillips, um, our history and um, mission and uh, evolution is entirely different from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, um, yes, we celebrated a hundredth anniversary in the midst of the pandemic in, in 2021. It was a museum founded by Duncan and Marjorie Phillips in the midst of that pandemic as a memorial gallery. He had his father had recently died and then he lost his brother in the pandemic. So that was, um, um, ear eerily. Um, resonant for us as we celebrated or tried to find a space in the midst of all of that chaos and um, uh, tragedy, uh, a, a platform in which to see, celebrate the museum, but more importantly, celebrate our communities and really uh, forefront our responsibility to our communities. So, um, I, to clues that guided us were really my rudder throughout my 15-year tenure, uh, both from Duncan Phillips. One went question, what are you trying to do? Uh, creating an intimate museum combined with an experiment station. So the idea of dynamic ideas, vitality, change, openness. Um, the other or maybe two. The other was to see as artists see. So again, it kind Hi. of what impressed well, me so well. profoundly um, it, uh, from my own educational formation is the to center the voice of the artist and the, the um, wisdom to be gained from the artwork. Um, and the... Um, Phillips had always embraced that idea of dynamic change, move the pictures around, form new conversation, be open to, uh, in a very um, democratic with small d way to broad communities. So those that was really, that had to be taken from my point of view as a mandate um, to maintain that sense of uh, dynamism. So seeing differently, in a sense, rifts off of to see as artists see and uh, really brings together a broad array of voices of artists, of figures in our community, of national and international figures that um, represent in the best possible way that the, the museum is a Forum is a stage for uh, the unrepeatable experiences of encounters with art, but also a, a platform for a rich and open exchange of, of ideas. 
I, I, I wandered far afield, but I, I <laughs> gives you a sense of what, where we were headed with, with um, you know, the central core part of your question. Well, I, absolutely. And I, I think that that is such a, a beautiful idea. The, the idea that part of what you're doing is creating and preserving these, these unrepeatable experiences. And that truly gets to something that is so unique to an encounter with art and being in an art museum. So, um, so Dan, I'd love now to hear from your thoughts, you know, how, how in your time at the Met have you kind of handled the, the possibility and the burdens of being a platform for ideas? Well, I think we can all acknowledge that museums do many things for our community. It's one of the reasons why they are so valued. But at the center of those array of things they do, being a platform or, or a forum for ideas is an essential component of that. And I reflect in most cities and most communities that museums are among the only places where everyone is welcome to participate in deliberation, shared discussion, shared learning, in the exchange of ideas in ways that if we were, if we didn't have such museums, we wouldn't have opportunities like that. Museums do that. And there are various ways in which they fulfill that mission. But we bring people from all over the community into our, to our space and create programming that is intended to, to not only provide learning opportunities, but opportunities for shared reflection and discussion. Sometimes it's heated and debated in ways that's very healthy and productive. That is to say, we shouldn't always be quiet and happy places, but it's a forum. It's a coffee house, as, as was imagined in 18th century London. That's one of the things that we do. So one of the great opportunities of the people who work in museums is to figure out how to use that platform in ways that engages the largest possible audience in the most meaningful ways. And given the diversity of communities that we serve, the experience base they have and the knowledge levels they have, it requires a great diversity of programming as well. But our goal is to use the platform in ways, as I think Dorothy said really well, to create unreplicatable experiences that are special and distinctive that make people want to come back for more of that and that we can all learn from each other. In this environment we live in today, ain't so easy anymore to do that. Everybody's ready to be offended very quickly and one can be very concerned about what you should or shouldn't be saying. And I think there's great danger in that for, for every sector of our society, including our museum. Well, they, they I interject something because it's, it's sort of, it's burning a hole in my pocket. Um, so to speak. But um, way back in, I think it was 2014, we had a terrific symposium, which was wrestling with a lot of these urgent ideas. And the, the artist, contemporary artist, Christoph Bojico, um, he, I sort of keep this on my desk because for me, it's kind of my, my mission statement. Um, uh, talking about the role of the arts, he said, one makes democracy. We must develop the capacity for communication and for fearless listening. And his entire talk was just riveting. But I bring that up because one of the things that I've written about in um, the, um, an essay that was published er earlier this year called Purpose is the Only Thing, Marcia Semmel, I see you there. Um, she edited this book with about 48 um, essays. Or earlier around um, a case for the importance of culture. It is that tension that Dan points out in his book, which I find just absolutely fundamental to what we're talking about, about the idea that, in my view, a museum may not be a neutral space, but on the, and the tension between that notion of making democracy versus being a politicized space. So we're not a neutral space, but um, I think that tension comes with people who mistake that idea with being a political, politicized uh, space. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's, um, and actually I, I, what you're saying about this, this tension between these, you know, our expectations of what a museum should be and how different people come with different approaches. That's um, a beautiful thing to our next question. And so I wanted to turn to the topic of public opinion in a museum's civic responsibility. Um, so in the last few years, you know, uh, it's been a pretty turbulent time. And, and in addition to COVID, as you're mentioning, we have all these protests surrounding George Floyd. 
And so this has been an interesting time in museums when it comes to, you know, reevaluating race representation and equity. And as a part of this, you know, there, there's been a whole range of um, kind of corrective changes that have been welcomed. Um, they've been needed in a lot of ways. But then there's also kind of sometimes in relation to this, there's that interesting flip side uh, where you'd have kind of the, the blind pressures of the crowd. And there's a great, uh, a great line that Dan quotes in his book from Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, the, the tyranny of the majority. And so, you know, as leaders, you both have been responsible for making those difficult choices. Um, and for kind of finding that balance, you know, that balance between the activist centered attitudes that can be outside of the museum, but also you're balancing that with museum's responsibilities when it comes to, I think, preserving culture, upholding culture, reevaluating culture. So um, let's do the flip of what we just did. So let's start with Dan. And I just want to ask, you know, are there instances in your own career where it's been difficult to navigate these competing impulses. Oh, I think there's there's great difficulty in doing this in a way that is thoughtful and effective for a large community, but it's what makes the work interesting. And the world we live in today is increasingly polarized in various ways, but also eager to have opportunities for meaningful engagement. And therefore, museums become increasingly accessible and relevant by modifying programs in a way that allow them to bring larger audiences into the, the fold. At the same time, it's important, and I talk about this in the book quite a bit, it's really important to hold on the, to the core mission of the institution. Our mission is not an activist mission. It is to preserve and advance the cultural heritage of civilization, and to do so in ways that allows people to learn, to discuss, to debate, and so forth. Where the work gets interesting is debating what the material is and how it's presented. But I think making sure we remember why we're here, that means if we think about the history of most institutions, certainly the Met, the circle of materials that were considered worthy of a museum was rather small. There was Western Europe and there was a little bit more, but mostly there was Western Europe and everybody kind of understood that's the material that belongs in a museum. As we learn more about the world and our own engagement with it, we have come to see that circle needs to be expanded. As we've increased the size and scope of our collections, we've also increased the levels of expertise that are necessary to do justice to that material. Expertise matters. Scholarship matters. That's part of our core mission. So as we expand our own program and reach out to larger audiences, I think it would be a mistake to lose sight of the value of bringing people into that work who are trained and expert in that work. Not just every voice is interesting, but not every voice brings the same kind of value to the deliberations. So the challenge and the art of this is expanding mission in ways that is responsible and respectful of the core values of the institution as we expand audiences and respect the level of knowledge they bring to the work, which varies. And that's a complicated algorithm to get all of that right. We don't always get it right. But the way the world has changed in recent years is the expectation is that we're going to do that more thoughtfully, more proactively than we have in the past. And I think that's entirely a good thing. I think that's fascinating. And I think to your point, that idea of expanding the collection means expanding the range of experts, expanding the community. You know, I, I can see how that would reflect a very holistic kind of change in the system. Um, just real quick, I'm going to put in a plug for, for Dan's book, uh, Why the Museum Matters. And if you go to the chat section, you'll see that we've um, uploaded a flyer that has a discount for you to buy the book. It's Yale University Press. It's an exquisite book, whether you are a museum practitioner or just someone who thinks deeply about culture. It's lovely. I absolutely encourage you to read it. It is, it's a refreshing, thoughtful examination. So um, now moving on, Dorothy, we'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, how, how do you kind of deal with those tensions, as you alluded to earlier, and these... Uh, these different perspectives that can sometimes be conflicting. Uh, um, so you you mentioned our the rather lovely um, copious publication that accompanied our centennial, seeing differently um, the multiplicity of voices, of perspectives. Um, no, you know, artists, curators, members of that community. That was ex very deliberate and intentional. Um, bringing in um, 
expertise and points of view within our curatorial staff that were adequate to allow us to do that work in a responsible and um, um, intellectually significant way. I want to relay one story uh, from the year 2020 when um, I think every museum and cultural institution across this country was in a existential cramp of crisis on many different fronts all at once. Um, uh, and there was, in the midst of that year, there was a, and I'm going to try to abbreviate this, but also to protect the, um, the internal um, communications of, of the Phillips collection, but there were some vehement voices within the museum insisting that we should um, hang Black Lives Matter um, banners on the facade of the Phillips. Um, there were other voices, including my chief diversity officer, who, by the way, I had, we had started our initiative to focus on those crucial issues way back in 2015. She was already on board. I think we hired her in 2018. And she said, it was almost, this is not a quote, but I got the tone from McKeeba Clay sort of over my dead body. I mean, she was vehement. You haven't earned this. This you you know do the work, don't make empty gestures. And I was put in the um, unenviable position, but it's part of the job description of being pulled in these two diverging positions. But I hired that woman with that expertise and profound understanding to guide us in that work, and I stuck with our decision, the staff's decision not to do that. However, later in the year, we did work with the artist, Jenny Holzer, and we had two banners, but this was an artwork by Holzer, and the two banners on the facade of the, of the building said, moral injury, so vote. And for me, that was much more appropriate because we were collaborating with an artist, um, it was not simply adopting a, a slogan, um, but was um, really um, aligned with our mission um, and was not, I think we, we uh, was not indulging in um, political agitation, but indulging in thoughtful um, wrestling with ideas and societal and and uh, 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 urgent issues from the perspective of an art museum and the artists. That's that's wonderful, and that um, what a thoughtful middle way that you all found. And I'm I'm sure it wasn't easy to navigate the you know the the heightened emotions on on all ends. Uh, so I before I move on to our final question, before we move to Q and A, I just wanted to ask Dan, do you have anything that you you want to add to that, or can we move? Should we move on to our next one? Well, I think as as Dorothy said, well, there are doing this sort of work is difficult. What makes it meaningful is to make it authentic. And to be authentic in your own environment, in your own moment, requires you to think carefully about who you are and what needs to happen. And in the advent of Black Lives Matter movement and in the summer of 2020, there was enormous pressure on our institutions to leap into action in ways that wasn't always authentic but that would keep people out of trouble and avoid criticism. And I think the, the institutions that did best at this are the ones that thought carefully about how do you do that authentically and most important, sustainably. It's one thing to, to get some good media in September and October of 2020, but where are you a year later or two years later in a way that's meaningful to the institution? So I think we need to take the long view of what constitutes meaningful engagement with this sort of change, but that's what's required. That's... That is a wonderful response. And, and, you know, you kind of, these themes are, are arriving between both of your answers, you know, authenticity, having a sustainable response and having it being meaningful and, and truly connected to the institution. So that's, that's really lovely. Thanks for that. Uh, so one last question before we move on to Q&A. And so now, now we're taking a, a hard left. We're going in a different direction. Uh, one thing that's 
really been quite the buzz in the artist and art world community is artificial intelligence. And um, and I know that the Met has, for a few years now, uh, teamed up with MIT and I think Microsoft. And they've kind of, you know, it, I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like you've explored the potential. So one thing that's interesting, and I'm sure that you all have seen this in, amongst your own circles, is that lots of artists are very concerned about the broader implications of AI. Uh, in particular, all these AI generators are kind of scraping the internet for all of its visual content, um, regardless of whether or not it's copyrighted. And so I'm actually just curious if you all, number one, have what just what your general thoughts are on AI and, you know, your experience being leaders of museums um, that have lots of copyrighted, but also creative, you know, you make a lot of your material open to all audiences. But also, do you think that museum directors should be thinking right now of maybe the threats that AI might pose down the way. So um, so why don't we start with Dan, just because I mentioned the Met's connections to, to AI work. Yeah, we have always taken the position that there are lots of things we can learn from new and exciting technologies that allow us to advance our mission. And AI is, is on the one hand, incredibly promising. It's also a little bit terrifying to see how quickly it's moving and what it's capable of. I don't worry, nor does anyone in the museum worry, and I'm sure Dorothy doesn't either, although she can speak for herself on this, about it supplanting the value of a museum experience. As we have seen all kinds of dazzling technologies come to the fore and increased levels of quality and digital representation, it hasn't diminished the experience, the, the ambition people have to come to museums and see the real thing. That has not happened. In fact, it's gone the other way. So I don't know what artificial intelligence ultimately will do not only to the human condition, but also to the work of our museum. But I think our posture has been, our strategy has been to embrace these technologies to the extent they allow us to advance our educational scholarship, public service mission, and not to chase technologies because they're cool and exciting. We're not able, even the Met with our vast resources, we're not able and we shouldn't be the leading edge developer of artificial intelligence in the visual realm. Let somebody else do that. Our job is to adapt these te technologies in ways that make our delivery of our mission more, more effective and more meaningful. So I think we're going to be behind that first wave of artificial intelligence. But I'll conclude where I started. I'm not worried about it it's supplanting us. It might very well supplement us in ways that will bring people in, once again, to connect with the real object. Because at bottom, human beings need to connect directly with these things. There has, there's a history as old as civilization itself that connecting with objects enriches and enlivens our experience and our understanding of the world. And that isn't going to change. That's wonderful. That's very much the support of the object. Uh, Dorothy, do you have any thoughts on the topic? I think I agree with Dan. I mean, decades ago, I think the entire museum industry was spreading about um, you know, the digital um, object supplanting the museum experience. And it, it proved, just as Dan said, quite to the contrary, it became a very powerful invitation for many more people to learn about art and to desire and to come to the museum. Um, I worry about AI in context of, like, of museums. I'll, I'll have to be frank. Um, which the implications seem pretty terrifying. But, um, um, you know, I, I think Dan is also correct. I think it's foolish to sort of resist and try to, um, you know, bar the doors to these um, tech changes in, in technology. I mean, what we, and this is in such a small way, you know, because oh, I also concur all, you know, all of this costs more than any museum can ever keep up with. Um, but, uh, you know, the advances with um, digitally native works of art that we now have in our collection, I think it's very exciting what artists are doing in that, in those uh, media. Um, also, the capacity to enlarge the in-gallery experience to objects far beyond the gallery through AR. You know, all of those things are tremendous um, enhancements to our educational capacity. So um, sort of glad I won't be 
will be in charge when my successor or his successors have to wrestle with AR. But um, uh, I think to to live in fear and denial is a useless stance. Part of what's terrifying is is that uh, dealing with AR, artificial intelligence, is something that's going to happen like by next Thursday. Right. It's right. it's happening very quickly. Right. It's I, extraordinary. I, yeah. I think most most people um, don't adequately um, understand how in um, museums that are always um, you know underfunded considering the scope of the mission and the aspiration that to run after these changes and to um, stay at the cutting edge or, you know, uh, it's so difficult, so challenging. I think many of our sister institutions across this country are simply, you know, outpriced. Um, it's very, it's very difficult. It's, it's going to be an interesting time of change ahead, whether, whether we like it or not. Um, so, and then just real quick, I also wanted to mention, as Dorothy mentioned, um, this wonderful exhibition catalog for the Seeing Differently exhibition. It is available and it is also, there's a link to it in our chat. So take a look at that. Um, it's going to be an exquisite collection of essays, uh, really worth reading. So now we're going to move into Q&A. And um, so, you know, we have about 20 minutes. Really grateful if folks could try to keep their Questions, comments, uh, riddles to very, very brief and very quick. I'm going to start with, um, there's two ways you can either put your question in the chat and we'll try to get to it, or you can raise your hand through the Zoom function or just, you know, frantically move around and hopefully I will see it on my screen. Um, so I'm going to start with David Skinner. He is a friend of American Purpose, an exquisite writer, and he's also runs the uh, National Endowment for Humanities magazine, Humanities. So, David, why don't, why don't you take it away with a question? Hi. Well, now that you've said that, I have to say, I, I'm only speaking for myself, of course. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Mr. Weiss, I, I wondered, you have um, some very interesting thoughts about museums in the history of nation building. Um, and I wondered, to the extent that we're, we're questioning the assumptions that go into museums and exhibitions, uh, do you think we are reimagining America and the American nation? And what does that look like? What, are, what is the nation that a young exhibitor or curator or museum director might have in mind as they try to address this unusual moment in their history? Well, I think the issue is, is larger and more complex than just nationalism, as it were. It has to do with the, the ways in which we think about cultural heritage and our levels of interconnectedness, the consequences of colonialism. What does it mean to possess something? And who has the right to tell stories? All of those issues are interconnected in the new moment we live in within the museum world. And so I think what we are finding that is promising is that as we come out of this first wave of, of protesting and activism following the summer of George Floyd's murder and all that ensued thereafter, there are new levels of inquiry about what actually is, the, rather than just tearing down the existing structures, what, what actually would be a better model moving forward? And so I think what young curators see, I'm hopeful that they see, is much more receptivity to new and innovative thinking about that, much less rigidity about how museums do things and how they think about what's possible and what's not possible. We are more innovative, more flexible, more responsive, in some ways more accountable by virtue of the world we're in today. And I'm hopeful that those things will continue. But to be more specific, I think as we face very specific questions, for example, about cultural property, who gets the right to own stuff? Should the British Museum really be allowed to keep the Elgin marbles? How does one sort that out? Who has ownership rights to that? What does the law say? What is the ethical thing to do? As we face those issues more directly and more squarely today than we have ever before, and the Met's doing it too, with regard to lots of material, we're going to develop new models for how we think about um, ownership of property, who holds title, how, how we might collaborate and work in partnership. And that, in some ways, in the cultural sphere, explodes an idea of nationalism. Because increasingly, I think what will happen is there'll be more levels of interconnectedness between the Metropolitan Museum and the Nigerian government and the Greek government and various other places. And if I were to hopefully imagine a better future, that means in the next generation, 
some of these ideas that we have thought were central to our purpose, like collecting and owning, will be seen as somewhat antiquated to new ideas about how art is stewarded and supported and studied and presented. So I'm hopeful that for young people, this is a good moment. Great. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, moving on to one question from our chat, we'll just continue doing that back and forth, is from Eric Mankin. And so he essentially kind of has a question about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, he would like your thoughts on it's had such a profound effect in the museum setting. And he raises an interesting point. Why museums, for example, and why has the movement had a profound effect in like symphony orchestras, for example? So actually, maybe Dorothy, if we could, if we could start with you. Yeah, well, I, I guess I wouldn't agree with the premise because I think um, um, symphonies, theaters have uh, are also confronting these these challenges in terms of, you know who performs, who conducts, what the programs consist of, um, you know, in, the, in exactly the same way as um, museums are being challenged to, as Dan already said, have the, um, the adequate expertise to uh, address new areas of inquiry, but also to balance um, our exhibition of programs, our um, acquisition programs so that we authentically connect with uh, the broadest array of our audiences. But I, I don't think that symphonies were at all um, immune from, from these pressures. Great. Dan? Well, I, it's an interesting comparison, and I, I agree with Dorothy. I suppose in part, though, the perceptual difference is that the repertoire of what say, a classical music organization or performs is more limited than what an art museum contains. Um, that it, maybe that's part of it. I don't really know. I'm speculating. But I do think that every, every cultural organization is accountable and responsible for thinking in these same terms about how to expand their mission and to be more access accessible, all the ways Dorothy said. But in art museum, we have 1.5 million works of art in our collection. And I don't know how many artists are represented. 300,000, something like that. Hmm. And it may be that the repertoire of a Philharmonic Orchestra doesn't have 300,000 pieces. It's a different, there's Beethoven, and then there's Bach, and then did I mention Beethoven? You know, I don't know. There, there are experts on this call, like Joe Horowitz, who is, who is with us now, uh, who know much more than I do, but maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Within an art museum, the expectation is everybody makes art. Everybody has a right to see art. I want to see my culture represented here, and I don't. Uh -huh. Okay, great. That's that's very interesting. Um, so moving on, we have a question from Sonia Michelle. Sonia, would you like to uh, just pop in and, and give us your thoughts or I can read it from the chat if you'd like? Uh, I can read it. Thank you. Uh, this is very much re related to what, hello, everybody, uh, to what was just uh, discussed. In the art world, we often hear that a piece of art is museum quality. How and ha have uh, criteria for this changed? What's happened to the old masters in the face of challenges from artists who are women or who come from other that, that is non-Western cultures? How has this affected acquisitions, the framing of exhibits and so forth? And I'm thinking about the Philip Salinas show, which is wonderful, Poor Tear Carm, which I gathered, Dorothy, was probably your last project before leaving the museum, which really changes what art looks like, but the materials that are used. And as, as, a, as a collagist myself, I really appreciated it. So I just wondering if you could talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment on the show. Um, yeah, I, I strolled through with um, one of the curators, uh, Camille Brown, who I even think is on the call, or one of our new members of uh, Philip's curatorial staff, uh, who helped bring a real freshness to that installation. But of course, um, now no longer being at the helm, I was exceedingly proud of all of the, the new toys that, you know, it was not billed as a recent acquisition show. It has that theme about materiality. But I thought it was so bracing, uh, not simply because I was proud, but because it was filled with new materials, new manipulations of form, fresh voices, and I think um, reveal very... Um, eloquently that the uh, 
um, the diversification of the Phillips collection to embrace the artists of our time, uh, as Duncan Phillips did in his championing of contemporary art and of um, living up to that notion of experimentation, um, really has a sense, has, has an integrity um, um, and a clear um, responsiveness to the historical work, works of art as well. But you know, Dan, um, I forget when it was, maybe six months, nine months ago, I had the pleasure of walking through some of the period rooms which, um, which had been inhabited by mannequins in, in costumes, which I had never seen before at the Met in that fashion. But I found that just so bracing and inspiring, and I think is a reflection of this idea of opening up the narrative through partnership and collaboration between departments and between uh, different areas of expertise. Do you recall the show I'm talking about? Yes, we invited a group of very prominent directors to, as it were, dress the set of various period rooms. So Martin Scorsese and others got a chance to to do that, and it was uh, it was it was very popular and quite interesting. I, I think one part of your question is about how we think about creating a canon and how we make decisions about what constitutes enduring value in art. And I would just say briefly, as we reflect on the question, two of the most popular artists that ever lived are Vincent van Gogh and Johannes Vermeer. Vermeer's show at the Rijksmuseum now is probably the most popular art exhibition of all time, that if you want to go see it, you probably have to spend thousands of dollars on eBay for a ticket if you don't know somebody. Uh, it's a rock star concert performance kind of thing. And neither of those artists were successful in their lifetimes at a level that would be memorable. Vincent van Gogh, as we all know, didn't sell anything. And Vermeer, is, uh, he sold to... to modestly in his neighborhood. He wasn't particularly considered great. And so I think what we worry about at the Met and other institutions like ours is how do you make judgments about what constitutes collection-worthy stuff? And we bring expertise and capacity for reflection and the weight of history on many of our judgments. It's not that hard to decide Rembrandt's worth collecting. Uh, it's much harder on the forefront of contemporary art where we don't yet have a sense of what's going to be of enduring value or why. And that's why in my own view, and, and my view on this is not exactly the same as Max Holines, the director here, that um, we shouldn't be so quick to be collecting art of, of artists that are very much contemporary in the leading edge because we have a slightly different role in the world than say other contemporary art museums do. In the constellation of art markets, galleries, art museums, there's enough going on that allows us to get a sense of what might be of enduring value in our society in terms of artistic creation. And the Met's only one piece of it, but we're very thoughtful about that because when things come into our museum, it means something. And we have to bring all of those considerations I just mentioned to those judgments and where we can be wrong, which is one reason why museums don't deaccession very much because nobody wants to get caught wrong deaccessioning some of those crappy paintings by Vincent van Gogh that nobody wants to see. Um, that happens. You don't want it to happen often. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's uh, van Gogh had some good work and he had some not great work. And well, most of it's great. It's it good. <laughs> 10 years ago. That's his prerogative, right? Uh, so I, I want to make sure that we fit in what we can, but also leave a few seconds to hear both of you if you have any concluding thoughts. So let me throw out one more question. It might be all that we have time for. Um, and I think James Rubin makes a really good point. He mentions that before retiring a few years ago, he was reproached by an anonymous student for showing Manet's famous nude picture of Olympia. And, um, Obviously, that connects to what we've seen with Michelangelo recently. David's Michelangelo. Uh, so he asked the question, you know, imagine that one of these two works were in your collection. How would you respond to these criticisms? Oh, where to begin? Um, you know, the, this, this nation um, began and continues to be... Um, hampered by an anti-intellectualism and a puritanical streak, streak that is um, very strong, never really goes away. Um, so I don't think any of us should be surprised by these 
reactions. Um, I think a museum has to be prepared to have intelligent responses. Um, uh, you know, and there are so many ways in which to to contextualize, to to educate. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm now I'm flummoxed by by thinking thinking about. But I do think the mayor of Florence had a great solution: is travel and learn, you know. Mm -hmm. Invite everyone to come see the scandalous, uh, scandalous sculpture in, in the nude. So, Dan, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I'm cautiously optimistic that the level of idi idiocy associated with that decision will help people to see that the pendulum needs to swing back to center more, which is exactly what your organization is dedicating to helping people to see the value of taking a point of view that is more enlightened and informed by different points of view and more looks like in the center. It, it, we, none of us could easily have imagined that what we saw on The Simpsons 10 years ago is real life now, any more than perhaps other political masquerades of the last few years would have come to fruition as they have. But I'm hopeful that the great center of our society, that thoughtful people deliberating on the issues, will realize that this is every bit as stupid and pernicious as book burning was in Berlin in 1937. And that ultimately our path, our society is on a path to complete destruction. If Michelangelo can't be shown to school children in Florida. Um, I don't know where this ends any more than any of us do. But if we think about the arc of history and our own history in this country, there have been other chapters of stupendous stupidity that have found a way back to something like the center. And McCarthyism is one example that comes to mind. So I don't know how long this, this particular adventure will obtain before we find our way back, but I'm hopeful that we do. But I don't know, what the hell, it's hard to say. <laughs> well, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's museums helping bring the stupidity back to the center and find, exactly. finding that connection. That's Circle. That's another for our coffee mugs. We bring stupidity <laughs> back to the center. On the other side of the, you know, oh. museums, the arc of history, the arc of civilization. Uh, yeah, two, two faces of the same coin. <clears throat> so we have just a few minutes left, and I actually would love uh, Dana Dorothy, if you have any closing thoughts, closing remarks, any last things you wanted to say. I, I think that this has been a beautiful wrap-up so far. Well, first of all, and um, grateful to be included in this lovely to have this talk with you dan and uh thank you to jeff and american purpose and all sorts of friends in this zoom room which is nice um so i just just a thought uh, i'm not going to um, presume to have any grand closing um uh statements but i'm so very happy that in the fall of 2024 at the phillips collection unless the, the, the exhibition schedule has changed since my departure We'll have a show of William Gropper. Camille should nod if, if, if we're still doing that. Um, and it, Gropper was very prominent as a political caricaturist in the McCarthy era. Sure. And so uh, it certainly dovetails with the, with the great um, Daumiers and other um, caricatures in the Phillips collection. So there's a link to the legacy. But... Um, uh, I just thought it was so delicious to have the opportunity to highlight that material during the election season. So, oh, that'll be fantastic. Cannot wait for that. Dan, and what are your thoughts? Well, very briefly, I'll just say how heartening it is to have these kind of conversations and to look out at so many people interested in these issues. And uh, if all of us continue to pay attention and to do what we can, to advance what we think are the values of a free society, then there's no greater chance that that will continue to be what we focus on in our world. So that's very heartening, and I'm grateful for that. The other thing I would say is in writing this book, I was really reflecting on what I thought were some of the great challenges that we face. And I have been extraordinarily gratified to see the degree to which people really do care about museums and understand and appreciate their multidimensional importance in our society. If we think about what does it take to sustain a free society, a pluralistic free society, it is essential to have institutions that allow people to engage in meaningful work across difference. And I can't think of very many that do that more importantly and more successfully within our communities than museums do. So they aren't just 
ornaments of beauty, but they're also places of essential uh, democracy building work. And um, if we can hang on to that, then museums will play an important role in the future too. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. And you know, the, the hope continues that we can all be a part of helping museums, supporting museums, supporting wonderful books written about museums, recently published by directors of museums. There's lots of things that we can do just to uh, to support this this great cause, so to speak, and enjoy it too. And um, so just thank you so much, you know, on behalf of the American Purpose team, Jeffrey Gedman, Seb Lipset, Michelle High, Rachel Harrison, Laura Silverman, we've got the whole team on here. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and thank you everyone who's here and joining us. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to kind of engage and grapple with these questions. Uh, it's just been such a pleasure and privilege and uh, we're so happy to have had this conversation and um, I guess we're all going to be visiting our local museums this weekend. So catch the bug. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank sure. you all. Mm -hmm.